Previously, we've covered the iconic six million dollar man on Gone But Not Forgotten. It's only right that we also showcase Steve Austin's equally amazing bionic cohort, the bionic woman, who is as popular as the six million dollar man and was an important piece of TV history for a number of reasons. It would give women, girls, and guys a new perspective on just how powerful a woman could be, not only in a robotically enhanced strength, but also in their character. Jamie Summers was something special, and not even a TV death could keep her down. On this episode of Gone But Not Forgotten, listen close as we tell the story of the bionic woman. The bionic woman herself was introduced in season two of The Six Million Dollar Man, already an important part of Steve Austin's life. Jamie Summers and Steve had a relationship from their younger years, and upon their meeting again in this episode, become romantically involved once more. On a date skydiving with Steve, Jamie's chute doesn't deploy, and she's horribly injured. Due to this, Steve goes to his crew, begging for Jamie to be fitted with bionics to keep her alive. But Jamie's condition isn't as stable as Steve's was. Due to her newly minted bionics malfunctioning, Jamie has a blood clot in her brain that gives her horrible headaches. Eventually, between her bionics malfunction and the hemorrhage, she loses control and collapses. Jamie dies on the operating table, and it devastates Steve. It's interesting here, as the entire sequence of Steve chasing Jamie down happens during a thunderstorm. It makes me think of the Bride of Frankenstein quite a bit, which makes sense when you think of Jamie being put back together as she was. No one else in the world is like Steve and Jamie. The scene of Jamie in the operating room is pretty devastating for not only Steve, but for fans of the show and everyone wanted her back. So with a bit of TV magic, and cryogenics, Jamie Summers was brought back to life in the next season of The Six Million Dollar Man. But it wasn't what would be called a happy reunion. Kenneth Johnson created Jamie and wrote the original two-part episode. He would write her comeback for the now classic two-part episode, The Return of the Bionic Woman. Steve and Jamie are completely star-crossed lovers. Sadly, Steve finds out the hard way that he's been lied to about Jamie still being alive. This is after he's been in another horrible accident, which causes damage to his legs where he's put in the same hospital as Jamie. It turns out that the scientists put Jamie into a cryogenic sleep until the blood clot in her brain could be removed. The issue is this causes Jamie to forget her accident and more importantly, her relationship with Steve. Eventually, Steve realizes that his involvement in Jamie's life is causing her to have horrible headaches and pain. Even though it destroys him emotionally, he decides the only thing he can do is give her up and have her removed to another location. The following year, Jamie would get her own series on ABC, with The Bionic Woman premiering in January of 1976. The new series finds Jamie heading back to the ranch that Steve's parents own and taking a job for a cover as a teacher at a local Air Force base. The first two episodes of the new series were written by Johnson. It doesn't take long though for Jamie to start working with OSI on missions. This seems like it is going against what was established in the last episodes featuring Jamie. It sort of does, but we can assume she's building back new memories and strengths. Jamie Summers was played by Lindsay Wagner. Wagner started working as a model and in 1971, she signed a contract with Universal Studios and worked as a contract player. Wagner worked as a model in Los Angeles and gained some television experience by appearing as a hostess in Playboy After Dark. She later wound up working on TV shows like Adam 12, Owen Marshall, Counselor at Law, The FBI, Sarge, and Night Gallery. But it was her work on The Rockford Files that got her the role. Producer writer Kenneth Johnson had been looking for the lead for the series. He saw many actresses, but he was impressed by Wagner's performance on The Rockford Files. He said he felt she was charming and down to earth. He said the audience wanted a hero who could be the girl next door. So Wagner was hired, and that's when the magic began. The series would see Jamie running up against a number of interesting scenarios and pretty strange plot lines. This would include the Fembots, Aliens, her own double who was played by actress Lindsay Wagner, and takes on Steve's most famous foe, Bigfoot. Jamie would also, in the third and final season of the series, gain a new friend in the form of Maximilian, aka Max, one of OSI's first experiments in bionics 
and who is a big ol' adorable German Shepherd. It becomes apparent that Jamie loves dogs, because when she finds out that Max is scheduled to be put down, since they suspect him of rejecting his bionics, well, you can add PETA hero to Jamie's resume. It turns out Max isn't actually rejecting his bionics. He's been traumatized by a fire in the lab where he had his modifications. Over the course of the first two episodes of season three, he comes to face his fear and helps save the day. This also shows OSI scientists that they were in the wrong about the dog and they changed their minds on putting him down. Max the Bionic Dog was actually at one point going to have his own TV series. The mid to late 70s were big times for dogs, so this probably would have worked. But with the third season being the final one for the Bionic Woman and the cancellation of the Six Million Dollar Man, it wasn't meant to be. The third season of the series was its last, and it would actually bow out only a few months after the finale of the Six Million Dollar Man. But the two series would not be on the same networks. In the first case of this happening in the history of television, as far as I know, The Bionic Woman was canceled on ABC after its second season and would be picked up by NBC for its final. This would cause a problem though for there to be a six million dollar man showing up in the series. Unlike Buffy and Angel, which wasn't hampered by a network switch and would allow the characters to show up on each other's series, ABC wouldn't allow Lee Majors to show up on a rival network show as it was stipulated in his contract with the show. But this didn't stop other characters from doing so. This would be one of the first times characters would show up on two rival networks while appearing in different series, with Oscar Goldman and Rudy Wells, aka Richard Anderson and Martin E. Brooks, to appear in both series. This caused there to be some issues in continuing the love story of Jamie and Steve. So in the third season, the late Christopher Stone would be cast as Chris, a love interest and partner for Jamie. No, that's not Tom Atkins. This is the gent who turned into a werewolf in The Howling. Tom Atkins fought teenage alien slug zombies. Lindsay Wagner was awesome as Jamie Summers, and she was a hero and role model to women and girls during this time. The 70s saw a lot of powerful female role models appear on television. This was the decade that saw live action Wonder Woman and Linda Carter and Charlie's Angels. Jamie was a lot like these other women and that she tried not to use brute strength too often when it came to issues she was solving. She was smart, she was kind, and she, like Steve, had to come to terms with who she was now with her bionics. In fact, the last episode of the series had Jamie wanting to leave the OSI in order to focus on herself and her own mental health and well-being, something the agency wasn't willing to do. But Jamie eventually did get them to agree to her continuing to work with them on her terms. For Wagner herself though, working on the series wasn't quite so easy. Lindsay Wagner had to do a lot of her own stunts, where Lee Majors actually had been a stuntman, something he'd sing about and portray on screen eventually in The Fall Guy. Wagner wasn't, but she went ahead and did them anyway. Even when it came to a dangerous helicopter stunt that wasn't quite to the level of security it should have been, without a security harness in place and falling to an airbag. The character of Jamie, as I said, was important for young women. The team behind the show wanted anything that was tied in the ways of toys and merchandise to also show Jamie as more than just a pretty face. Like the $6 million man toys, the Bionic Woman toys had neat tie-ins to the character's powers. For example, if you turn Jamie's head, you could hear the sound effect of her super hearing. Her arm had an area where you could see the circuitry in it. But Jamie, unlike Steve, also could be bought with a mission purse. And yes, actually it came with makeup and a wallet with bionic bucks. Also, for some reason, instead of a picture of Steve in her wallet, she had a picture of Oscar. Mission purse aside, the Bionic Woman toys were pretty neat. Jamie had a sports car and even a house you could get but also a bionic beauty salon. And no, I'm not making that up, no matter how much I wish I was. You could get a Fembot toy as well as an 18 inch tall Jamie and one of those hairstyling head and shoulders toys where you could do up disembodied Jamie's hair. Styling was apparently a big deal here, but it was pretty cool they made Bionic Woman temporary tattoos for girls so they could pretend they had lost their own limbs and had them replaced just like Jamie. Much like Six Million Dollar Man in a number of series in the 70s, The Bionic Woman had a number of interesting guest stars to show up on missions with Jamie. Some notable and noble names include Andy Griffith, 
Terry Kaiser, Christy McNichol, Hoyt Axton, Abe Vigoda, Dan O'Herlihy, and Julie Newmar, to name a few. Richard Anderson and Martin E. Brooks would continue their roles as Oscar Goldman and Rudy Wells, as they would on Six Million Dollar Man, as I previously mentioned. As we discussed in the Six Million Dollar Man episode, Steve and Jamie would return in made-for-TV movies starting in 1987. In the second of these, 1989's Bionic Showdown, The Six Million Dollar Man and a Bionic Woman, a new Bionic Woman would be created in the form of Sandra Bullock. At one point, there was talk of giving her character Kate Mason the series, but this didn't happen. Steve and Jamie would actually tie the knot in Bionic Ever After. This would be the last time the characters would be seen as played by the original actors. Notice I said the original actors. The Bionic Woman has the distinction of having been rebooted and remade into a new series, unlike The Six Million Dollar Man. Back in 2007, for eight whole episodes spread over about a month of time, NBC aired The Bionic Woman. The series starred Michelle Ryan as Jamie Summers, who is now a bartender and whose boyfriend is the scientist who fits her out with cybernetics after an accident nearly kills her. Possibly a nod to the fact that Lindsay Wagner's younger sister motivated her to take the role of the original Bionic Woman, in this series, Jamie has a younger sister she takes care of. The series had a really strong sci-fi pedigree, with a cast that included Mark Shepard, Katie Sackhoff, and the late Miguel Ferrer, who apparently really loved being in charge of robotically enhanced superheroes brought back from the dead. The series was produced in Canada, but didn't get much in the way of interest from viewers. The last nail in the coffin of the series was the writer's strike the same year it was aired. No further episodes were produced after the strike, and NBC pulled the plug on the series. Kenneth Johnson, the actual writer and creator of the original series, had nothing to do with it either, which probably didn't help matters. If you watch the show, you can see its wasted potential. Michelle Ryan is a great lead and Katie Sackhoff is an incredible villain, but the supporting cast was weak. Jamie's sister is an annoying teenager, always whining, and the supporting characters are as dull as wet paint. Sadly, we will never know if the series could have been saved. Currently, the only way to stream The Bionic Woman is to buy it on Amazon. However, if you're interested on great special features, you should buy the DVDs, which are still in print. So that leaves us here with that classic question, should The Bionic Woman return? It's apparent that it's hard to replicate what made the original so special. There's just something truly great about the original series, and Lindsay Wagner just brought something special to Jamie. There's also the fact that these shows were so unabashedly weird in the most wonderful way and embraced it. Bigfoot, aliens, bionic dogs, and friggin' fembots, man. These days, shows would bring plots like that in just for laughs. But the bionic woman played it straight and kept a charm you can't fake. You can change the name to Cybernetics to try and add some flash, but I'll take a slow motion run every time.